I took the house of Brentwood on my return from India in 1881 for the temporary accommodation of my family until I could find a permanent home for them. It had many advantages which made it peculiarly appropriate. It was within reach of Edinburgh, and my boy Roland, whose education had been considerably neglected, could go in and out to school, which was thought to be better for him than either leaving home altogether or staying there always with a tutor. The first of these expedients would have seemed preferable to me. The second commended itself to his mother. The doctor, like a judicious man, took the midway between, put him on his pony, and let him ride into the high school every morning. It will do him all the good in the world, Dr. Simpson said, and when it's bad weather, there's the train. His mother accepted this solution of the difficulty more easily than I could have hoped, and our pale-faced boy, who had never known anything more invigorating than Simla, began to encounter the brisk breezes of the north and the subdued severity of the month of May. Before the time of the vacation in July, we had the satisfaction of seeing him begin to acquire something of the brown and ruddy complexion of his schoolfellows. The English system did not commend itself to Scotland in these days. There was no little eaten at Fetty's, nor do I think if there had been, that a genteel exotic of that class would have tempted either my wife or me. The lad was doubly precious to us, being the only one left us of many, and he was fragile in body, we believed, and deeply sensitive in mind. To keep him at home, and yet to send him to school, to combine the advantages of the two systems, seemed to be everything that could be desired. The two girls also found at Brentwood everything they wanted. They were near enough to Edinburgh to have masters and lessons, as many as they required for completing that never-ending education which the young people seem to require nowadays. Their mother married me when she was younger than Agatha, and I should like to see them improve upon their mother. I myself was no more than twenty-five, an age at which I see the young fellows now groping about them with no notion what they are going to do with their lives. However, I suppose, every generation has a conceit of itself which elevates it, in its own opinion above that which comes after it. Brentwood stands on that fine and wealthy slope of country, one of the richest in Scotland, which lies between the Petland Hills and the Firth. In clear weather you could see the blue gleam like a bent bow, embracing the wealthy fields, and scattered houses of the great estuary on one side of you, and on the other, blue heights. Not gigantic like those we had been used to, but just high enough for all the glories of the atmosphere, the play of clouds, and sweet reflections which give to a hilly country an interest and a charm which nothing else can emulate. Edinburgh, with its two lesser heights, the castle on the Colton Hill, its spires and towers piercing through the smoke, and Arthur's seat, lying crouched behind like a guardian no longer very needful, taking his repose beside the well-beloved charge, which is now, so to speak, able to take care of itself without him, lay at our right hand. From the lawn and drawing-room windows we could see all these varieties of landscape. The color was sometimes a little chilly, but sometimes also as animated and full of visitude as a drama. I was never tired of it. Its color and freshness revived the eyes which had grown weary of arid plains and blazing skies. It was always cheery and fresh, and full of repose. The village of Brentwood lay almost under the house, on the other side of the deep ravine, down which a stream, which ought to have been a lovely, wild, and frolicsome little river, flowed between its rocks and trees. The river, like so many in that district, had, however, in its earlier life, been sacrificed to trade, and was so grimy with paper-making. 
But this did not affect our pleasure in it so much as I have known it to affect other streams. Perhaps our water was more rapid, perhaps less clogged with dirt and refuse. Our side of the dell was charmingly accidente, and clothed with fine trees through which various paths wound down to the riverside, and to the village bridge which crossed the stream. The village lay in the hollow, and climbed with very prosaic houses. The other side. Village architecture does not flourish in Scotland. The blue slates and grey stone are sworn foes to the picturesque, and though I do not, for my own part, dislike the interior of an old-fashioned pewed and galleried church, with its little family settlements on all sides, the square box outside with its bit of a spire like a handle to lift it by, is not an improvement to the landscape. Still, a cluster of houses on differing elevations, with scraps of garden coming in between, a hedgerow with clothes laid out to dry, the opening of a street with its rural sociability, the women at their doors, the slow wagon lumbering along, gives a center to the landscape. It was cheerful to look at, and convenient in a hundred ways. Within ourselves we had walks and plenty, the glen being always beautiful, in all its phases, whether woods were green in the spring or ruddy in the autumn. In the park which surrounded the house were the ruins of the former mansion of Brentwood, a much smaller and less important house than the solid Georgian edifice which we inhabited. The ruins were picturesque, however, and gave importance to the place. Even we, who were but temporary tenants, felt a vague pride in them, as if they somehow reflected a certain consequence upon ourselves. Do not forget to leave a like and subscribe if you have enjoyed this video. And if you already have, thank you very much. La, la.